Hey guys, it's Joey and Ray, and I am super excited to be bringing you season three of A Human Connection. And just like all the other seasons, we're going to be bringing to you some of the most influential people in this industry, some people that I have followed and have, have mentored me along my 30 plus year career in this business. So hope you join along with us so we laugh and we learn along the way. Today, I am super excited to have a, I always say lifelong friend, I feel like for many, many years. We'll, we'll dig into our history together here in a minute, uh, but uh, would love to introduce you to my friend. This is Shanna Clark. She is president of MAS and a proud sister of Integrity Managing Partner of, of ours as well. So welcome, Shanna. Hi, thank you. Yeah, I'm super excited. There's a lot of a lot of uh, interweavings that we have over the course of our career. Um, but why don't, uh, for anybody that's not familiar with Shanna, why don't you give us just a quick little bio background, uh, where you started and how you got to where you are. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, I started in the insurance business about 27 years ago. I was working for my father-in-law. He had an agency in Plano, Texas. Okay. And uh, I was working with him and decided at that point, hey, you know what? I think I might want to get my license and learn a little bit more about the insurance business and, um, you know, just continue to work alongside him and, and see how thing go everything goes. Um, and then one of our um, reps from United Healthcare on the group side, he used to visit us at least once a month and, and he came in one day and he said, Hey, have you ever thought about selling insurance? And I said, well, you know, I mean, that's why I got my insurance license here is, you know, just kind of work alongside Buck. And he said, well, you know, we're United is, is rolling out a new product and I think that you would be <laughs> great. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know? And, um, so anyway, um, just to learn more about it, it was the Medicare Advantage plan or Medicare complete at that time. And uh, yeah. And so, um, I said, well, you know what, what the heck I'll go and interview. I don't have any sales experience, but you know, and I was newly licensed, but I said, you know, I'm, I'm willing to learn and, and take a chance if they're willing to take a chance. So I went down and interviewed and went through the whole process and they hired me. So that was. That was in 1996, and I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> in some form or fashion. In some uh, form or fashion, yeah. And on the carrier side, the FMO side, you've been an agent. So I would think in your, in your current role, that has to help you have empathy and understanding for all those things that you deal with. You deal with carriers, you deal with agents, you deal with other FMOs. So it's all of that was kind of built for... You seem to be in the perfect spot right now to be able to, because you understand all of those roles so much. Yeah. I mean, I definitely think that, you know, being out in the field um, was was helpful. Um, and it was certainly a journey. Um, you know, I, I can empathize with agents when they talk about, you know, being in the in the field and the, the windshield time and, yeah. you know, all of that. I mean, I, I'm, I know what it's like to just eat while you're in the car and you know you're going from one appointment to the next appointment but but gosh I think that um one of the things that that probably stuck with me the most was just that entire population of seniors and how uninformed they are about their benefits and um you know you just don't realize sometimes how some people live and um you know, I've been in homes where, you know, I didn't want to breathe the air or I sat on the, the tip of the couch or I said, you know what, let's just sit out on the front porch <laughs> and, and, and talk about this. So, uh, you know, and then I also learned that sometimes I was the only person that sometimes those people saw. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, it, you, you learn to empathize and I never really thought of that part of it as selling um, but more educating, educating people on what their benefits were and, um, you know, what they had access to and, you know, helping people qualify for Medicaid and now LIS. And so, I mean, there's just, there's, there's part, 
there's a lot of it um, that I never really felt like a salesperson, but more of an educator or, um, you know, somebody that, that helps them it's to be get active. Yeah, I can an advocate, really an advocate. Oh my goodness, yeah. So I can see you loving that part of you know being in the clients' homes, where regardless of what the home is like, I bet they fell in love with you. You probably fell in love with that generation and that type of customer. But was that hard to get used to, or did you always kind of gravitate toward the senior side? You know, what? I I I love the senior side of it. Um, you know, coming home with with a sack full of vegetables and you know <laughs> I don't know um, uh, yeah I mean and, I, and I've been I, you know I've been in the on the provider services side I, I worked in that and you know but really um my heart was was probably always with the with the seniors I think that's the beauty of of what you and I get to do now too is we may not talk to the seniors directly anymore but we're talking to the people who are setting up the plans for yes. those that do. So I think we we always do a big um, sales meeting, you know, the kick of AEP. And every month we look back and, and kind of do a recount. And we never, on our side, our career side touches the clients. But our side, we never do. We, we work with brokers who, independent agents, who go on and talk to their clients. But clients never call here. But we always talk about them. We always paint the picture of who they are, what they're doing, what that what that U card meant, or what that mm-hmm. savings of fifteen dollars a month meant. And so I just think it's important that otherwise we're just going to kind of get lost in AEP and numbers and stats and acronyms and and then really what are we doing? I mean that's yeah, yeah. Th- that's not going to be as fulfilling as understanding the end result. And we're lucky to have the career shop here. We'll get Clint or somebody to come over and share stories about the client still and share stories about what this particular product did or what this particular technology did. You know, we saw so many changes through COVID too of agents and how they had to pivot to meet their customer and what that meant to the customer. Because again, not to get going too much on on COVID and all of that, but if you remember, there was a lot of businesses that couldn't reach their client in any way, shape or form. So if we were able to you know, what a wonderful thing that was that our clients could still get a hold of us. So I, yeah. I, I, I can see you very much loving that, that part of the job of being with the seniors and talking with the clients and making a difference and seeing what this particular product you were there to talk about, how yeah. that ended up. So has most, so since the beginning days, has it, has it always been the senior side? Because you and I met through United, right? I think it was the first time. Yeah. First introduction uh, was when you were uh, working for United, and and uh, we just rolled out the the broker program. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so that goes way back. It goes way back. Yeah. So, um, so when I was at United, they I think what was that two thousand four? I think was when they originally came to us. Yeah. Um, and well, it was Pacific Air at the time. The Pacific really. area. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and they came to us and they said, you know, what? we're, we're going to, I think we're going to let agent sell our product. And we were like, what? You know, cause we'd been captive for so long. And, um, you know, they brought me in on a Friday afternoon and, and said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to do this. And we, we need somebody to help train agents on how to sell this and, um, how to sell compliantly. And so, um, at first I thought it was a joke. I thought, are you? you just trying to get rid of me or, you know, what, what I'm here. And so, um, they said, yeah, can you think about it over the weekend and then let us know, because we really got to find somebody that we want to put you into it over the weekend. You have to let it. <laughs> and so, yeah. And then career change. And so I went, I went back and I talked to my father-in-law and he said, wait a second. So you're saying that I could sell one of those plants, you know, because before he could only sell months. Yeah. And I said, that, that's what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. That you'll be able to sell. And he said, oh, Shanna, you, you know, you've got to do that. And so, I mean, here we are years, years later, you know, and, um, it's been a wild ride. I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, working with Don Rutherford, he was, he was one of my mentors and, um, I remember all of the, the contracts coming in for all of you guys that, you know, McNerney. 
uh, Cutler, um, Medicare Advantage Specialists. I mean, everybody around, you know, the nation. And, um, you know, they thought, oh, well, we're, we'll write, you know, we'll be lucky if we can write 15,000 of these and craziness. They did. We did three times that. And, um, yeah, well, so, I mean, ever do you remember when Pacific Air first came to us um, in 2004, the, the Medicare Advantage and Medicare Complete, that was fine. What they were really excited about was the PDP. Uh, yeah. I've heard this new product that you're going to take to every senior and every senior is going to want this product and it's going to be a drug plan. We've never had a, you know, a national care <laughs> or a drug plan. Everybody was going to, you know, build, be able to build a private island on all the money they were making from PDP. Yeah. <laughs> and then the Medicare Advantage was kind of a, it was fun to talk about, but it was kind of over to the side. It was all about the PDP, I remember. PDP and then private fee for service. Yeah. Private fee for service. Yes. I haven't heard those words in a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I remember we had to, you know, we had to pay out commissions manually. So, I mean, back at United, I mean, yeah. you know, uh, that was all manual process. I mean, Remember. training and compliance was all a manual process. I mean, I was up there on Sunday nights making copies of Medicare handbook, putting them into notebooks. We didn't have online training. You know, it was all. Do you remember the the certification process? Yes. It had to be face-to-face. Yeah, we, face to face. we were We were driving and flying all over the country. <laughs> We'd have, you know, groups of 30 to 300, whatever, depending on the location of agents. You had to read them the questions. Yes. They had a test just like we're in third grade. They had to answer their paper and then they had to turn in their paper. Yeah. We had to fly that back to, to our office. So we would ship that back because we were going on to the next location. So Mary here in our office should go through and grade them. Amazingly, most of our agents always passed. So she <laughs> go through and, and literally physically grade them, box them back up, ship them to United Healthcare with a score that says, you know, Joe agent got passed with an 87 or Sally passed with a 94. Yeah. <laughs> we tell that to our staff now. Yeah, you were then that you were the one that got them. Yeah. We tell that to our staff now and they just look at us like, we've got to be making that story up. There's no way that could have actually happened. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. There was no online. They complained about how difficult or time consuming the online training is. And oh my goodness. They have to learn. Right? Yeah. Funny stories. I was talking with somebody yesterday that I've known almost as long as I've known you. And we were just talking about you, you forget about because you, you know, kind of linked some of the past in the past. But think about how did we even run an FMO back then? There was, you know, Internet was email was just getting started, but it wasn't mm-hmm. anything that was constantly being checked a thousand times a day. Definitely. And the applications were getting faxed in. All the fax machines. Hundreds and hundreds. Of applications being faxed in front and back, you know, agents or the poor founder to be there till midnight on cutoff day, you know, oh, so that to me, sure. or that all the apps came in and that they that we could page them together and process <laughs> them. I always I always tell the story to our staff that uh, what I remembered in the beginning days of how I could um, tell if we were having a good AEP or not was how many times during the weekend. I would have to come in and, and take all the papers off the fax tray because after that tray gets so many papers, it stops printing. Mm-hmm. So then you have to take those off and then more apps would spit through. So the more times I had to come in the office and take those papers off the tray, I'm like, yes, we're having a grading. <laughs> and now I don't even know, Shanna. It's like, oh, I know, we don't know where I can't see the physical apps anymore. So it's always, always funny to think about the, the fun days and how. You know, so much has changed, but really, you know, it hasn't changed too. Like so much of the things yeah. that we do, the why we do it, the just the mechanisms have changed, but everything else is, you know, it's blocking and tackling. It's all the basics. So yeah. So you're at United Healthcare. You're selling, then you're more on the the carrier side uh, mm-hmm. with FMOs like ourselves. Yep. How did was it the jump to Shep? Was that the first? FMO office? No, um, there was a there was a short stint um, with a partner that was underneath Shep. Okay, um, okay, yep. And um, so that was about for two years, and then and then Shep contacted me and said, you know, hey, you know, somebody called him a dinosaur, and he said they they said that I need to get into the I need to like up my game. 
then you know, and back then that would have been that was 2000, 2010. Oh, 2010. Okay. When you went to work for show? Or 2009. Okay. 2009. Okay. Yeah. So let's pretend there's somebody listening that doesn't know Shep Cutler or hasn't ever heard of him tell about Shep Cutler. Describe Shep Cutler in three minutes or less. Uh, bright suit, <laughs> pocket full of mini bottles, <laughs> can pull out the red nose and tell a, a clown joke. In a moment's notice, and love to do magic tricks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, quite the sales guy, yeah. but just such a great heart. Mm. Um, I remember when when he called me and he said, um, "Yeah, I'd like for you to come to Columbia, and you know, let's just sit down and talk." And he said, "You fly over here, you stay at my house, oh, and." Right. Um, yeah, and I was like, oh, you know, I don't even know. I don't know you. I don't know you. And um, he said, here, I'm going to give you my Amex number here. Write this number down, and you just you just put it all on the card. And I said, are you kidding? Really? And I made an outfit or two. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, but anyway, so I went, and it was probably – Five of the best years that I've that I've ever spent in this business. Yeah, yeah. Just sure. one of the words. There's so many words, but genuine comes to my yes. mind. You of I've never met somebody who has such a talent of always the center of attention. Like no matter what yeah. room, whether he's in church or a conference or airport, out to dinner, or whatever. Everybody wanted to sit next to him. Every he's a magnet, right? That type of personality. So you would think somebody that's that sees that many people and meets that many people in his life, he'd forget names or would names wouldn't even be important. He was so good at remembering mm-hmm. people's names. My husband still laughs to this day or, or marvels to this day about a I don't even remember the story. He was working at a in retail at the time, my husband was, and he was Shep was asking him all these questions and he told him a story, just a story about the store that day. It wasn't even a meaningful or impactful story in any way. Just a story that he was telling Jim. For the next like three years, Mark would see him like maybe once, maybe twice a year. And he remembered that he remembered his name and he remembered that story and he would ask for an update. And I'm like, we're all just like, he was one of a thousand people that Shep talked to that day. Yeah. But he was just so good at because he was just so genuine. He truly yeah. he talked to somebody, he truly cared what they were saying, who they were. Um, you know, he came across as silly and magician and always drinking and that was that was kind of the persona but man you peel back some of those layers and just one of the most big hearted genuine yeah oh so we're smart and smart yes yes that was a good trick too and and he wanted everyone to succeed yeah really i mean he wanted he wanted everyone to succeed you know and and he didn't really care how much it cost him um Sometimes in order order to do that. I mean, you know, I remember our last AEP event, he decided that he was going to give away a Mercedes for a year, at least, on a Mercedes. And we thought, Shep, you're going to lose money on this deal. And he's like, I don't care. I don't care. You know, he did it. Because like, yeah. he wanted whoever um, to have that feeling of success and to be able to drive the Mercedes and... He didn't care if he lost money on the deal or not. He wanted that person to be able to have that feeling. Very true. Oh. He he and Joni became um like parents to yeah. me. Yeah. You know, mine yeah. over on. So it was part when he when he passed. What year was what year was it that he passed? Two thousand fourteen. It was fourteen, okay. April he passed away on April first on April Fool's Day. Very fitting. Very fitting. <laughs> 2014. Yeah. 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 At his funeral, I remember Joni asked and, and everybody obliged by most of the guys coming in either bright colored or bright colors. to him. Joni even led into his closet. and Yes. So there were ties and jackets of every color there. And so many people wanted to speak and came to, to see him. But yeah, what a, what a true testament. I, I love that you said he wanted everybody to succeed. Because you don't, 
usually somebody that's of the stature that he was, very successful businessman, very influential in politics as well. He mm-hmm. yeah, you know, in politics. He and Joni started a school. I yep. mean, they just they did just high school. They, yeah, they didn't just take their money and buy more Mercedes. You know, right. the fact that, like you just said, it w- it was more fun for him to give away a Mercedes to watch somebody who had never driven something like that before than for him to sock it away and buy an even fancier car someday. Yeah. Well, you know, and Joni will say that, um, you know, she's probably built a wing over at the SPCA, you know, with all the animals and, you know. Because they, they very much, you know, love animals and yeah, just, just so, so giving. So giving. So I always try to think, you know, to honor somebody like that. Do you think about, because I don't want Shep's life and I know it hasn't, but what can we all, what somebody listening that didn't even know Shep or somebody that maybe has heard the Shep stories over the years, what, what could we all do to just make sure we're honoring him? Like enjoy life more, be more giving, like what so, the thing that you would say? I, I would definitely say enjoy life more. Shep, Shep very much, you know, he was the life of the party wherever we went. You know, he wanted to ensure that, you know, that everyone had fun. Um, I'll never forget, we were in Houston for a meeting. Um, we'd had the, we had a driver, we'd gone to like four different places, um, around town and, um, we got to the restaurant and, um, what was it? The Palm, I think it's the Palm Mm -hmm. in Houston. And we got there and, um, our driver let us off and Shep said, Oh, you know, he was going to let us off. And Shep said, no, let's just go find a parking space. And he said, no, sir, I'll, I'll let you off. And Shep said, no, let's go find a parking space. So we went, we found a parking space. He parked and he was like, okay, I'll let you out here. And he said, no, sir. He said, you're coming with us. And so he came in and ate dinner with us. And, you know, that's just, that's just how he was. And, you know, and it didn't matter where we were, if we were on the airplane, the flight attendants, I mean, he was a mess. He was, you know, I, he was an energizer bunny and I was much younger than he was by about 30, 40 years. Yeah. And he was hard to keep up with. Did not keep up with. What a great story. I think that's, that's a good takeaway too, because I've seen him in those environments where, you know, they say you can learn a lot about a person by how they treat somebody that has no bearing on your day right so the, right the wait the server the driver the person picking up the trash the somebody that you think is not impacting my life in any way it's how you treat those people and i think shep could probably give a master class on that because we saw it you know just a, as an audience for me you were always obviously much closer but for me just to watch was just a it's like a show like to yeah. watch up in action <laughs> Yeah, it was like I mean, people would pay money to watch that show. He was just the most gregarious, generous, uh, engaging. I guess that's another good word for Shep because it didn't matter if you knew him or not. He was bringing you in, you know. So I think those are those are good things that if nobody could emulate or or be a copycat of Shep, but man, if we could take those little pieces right and yeah. and be better humans, which is. You know, uh, I think what we're all after here, not, you know, we didn't say one thing about insurance, right? And that whole conversation about Shep, obviously very successful, obviously built a good following, obviously built a good FMO and a good company and had great employees. But the things that we're all talking about have nothing to do with that. And that's, I think, the biggest, the biggest takeaway of, of just the impact he had on people. Didn't matter who, where, when, how old, how young, (laughs) it didn't matter. (laughs) Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't, um, I would say, and, you know, and he and Don Rutherford, they were very, they were, they were best friends. And, yeah. um, you know, I've got a picture. We did a tailgate um, at a South Carolina game one year. And, you know, there those two were sharp dressed, you know, oh, we're at a football <laughs> game. And it's hot. And, you know, they're both out there with their, with their jackets and, you know, and just, um, you know, they're both sitting on a chair, just leaned over. You can tell, I just, you know 
what what was that conversation you know that they were in that that moment and i'll I, i've got that photo and i'm just like man you know that'd be one of those would be fun to put out to people to caption this photo yeah yeah <laughs> probably yeah. got lots of good responses <laughs> yeah so i would say that you know for myself um you know i've been very fortunate and that i had those two individuals um that i had the ability and the opportunity um, to work with, um, you know, and Don told me very early on, he said, you know, now you're a woman, you know, you're a woman and you know, you can't, you can't cry. Don't let them see you cry because if you cry, you know, then they're just going to think they can stoop all over you. So you got to toughen up, you know, and that's very Don. I did. I had to toughen up because I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm weepy. So Don, it's you know. Yeah. The so, team. Yeah. It, it was, it was great. It was a great time where we, we've both been very lucky that very early on in our career, we found people like that, the, the Dons, the Sheps, the Dan McNerney for me, um, as well to kind of, kind of tie our kite to, if you will. But have you had other mentors along the way or other people in your life yet or out of the business that have meant something to you or kind of shown you the path? You know, I would, um, you know, I think that probably my mom, um, what, you know, she passed away at age 50 of breast cancer. Um, I was at the time, but the thing that I remember most about her is that, you know, she grew up on a farm and, um, she knew hard work and, you know, but there was something very prissy about her. She was like, five, four, she wore like a size six shoe, you know, she was just, she was little and, and pristy. And, um, you know, my dad was six, four, you know, big, tall guy. And, um, but you know, she had us out there at an early age, you know, teaching us how to mow the yard. Now my dad wasn't on the yard. My mom was mowing the yard. So, you know, and this was before the, the mowy, the mower, had a bag on it you know that was you were really you know, know getting high up if you had the mower that had the bag and so it was like mowing and then raking and then putting it into the you know putting the the shavings into the bag and um you know she used to build shelves and saws and she sewed and um you know I just I learned so much from her that I mean even today you know it's it's for me it um, I love to be out in the yard. I love to garden. I love to power wash. There's, oh there's who isn't that so oh satisfying? It's so satisfying to power wash. Right now, I'm addicted to blowing leaves. So I'm out every day blowing leaves, set them on fire. You know, my kids are like, okay, you're getting a little crazy with the porch, mom. That's it with the touch. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just, but she taught me hard work. Yeah. And, um, and she taught me to be strong. Um, she was, you know, she taught us how, you know, when we were little, I mean, I had to, we, I learned how to make cheese toast and cinnamon toast and scramble eggs and, you know, all those things that, um, and make your, make your bed. You know, I had to make my bed every day and, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's something for that there's to be fed. Time you want to make your bed every day. And, um, so I would think that, that she, and then she was such a fighter, you know, she was a fighter when she was, when she was sick, she was diagnosed my junior year of high school and, you know, underwent a double mastectomy and, you know, just, just all the things, but, you know, was really a fighter and until she took her last breath and, um, I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, moms, I would say, you know, whether I lost my mom to cancer um, as well. I was older. I was 37, I think. Um, but I was telling a friend that was, it doesn't matter. I don't think it matters <laughs> how old you are when you lose your mom. It's your world changes. And yeah. there's so many times that now being a mom, she got to meet all of my children. She got to meet all of her grandchildren. Um and now they're having children, which is, you know, I can't help but look at them and think, oh, my gosh, my mom would love this. My mom would have loved Facebook. Like, she was a very, and that came after she passed, 
you know, she was always very social, always very connected, always wanting to, you know, she was our newspaper. I didn't have to read the paper, yeah. our local paper. She told me who everybody was when everybody was coming to see and how the kids were doing over here at this neighbor's house and that neighbor's house. She loved, I, I just, every time I think about Facebook, I think, my God, my mom would have loved that part of technology. So to not have her experience that was, you know, it's still tough to this day and it's been 20 years. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's hard. Um, I, I wish that she would have gotten to meet her grandkids. And then, you know, now obviously, you know, the loss of, of Daryl, I, you know, he, he's been gone, um, four years. Wow. So, um, you know, and he, I've got two grandchildren now. And so it's hard because I just think, gosh, you know, he, we, we looked forward mm -hmm. to that day, to that time, you know, he wanted to be a papa and, um, you know, and for him to not be here and to get to, to see or to meet Kaylin and, and Miles and then, you know, Avery and Tanner, when they have theirs, um, you know, it's hard. Yeah. Really hard. So cancer has been... A big part of your life, unfortunately, it sounds like through yep. your mom and Jeff. My mom, my dad, my yeah. husband, <laughs> yeah. grandfather. Yeah. 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 So I know that that's super hard. Um, so kind of walk me through what did that do anything? Because that's the world that we live in, right? That's we, we sell cancer insurance. Is that has the pain that you were forced to go through with your own family due to cancer? What has that done? to you from a, from a business standpoint, probably just yeah. fighting. Um, you know, I, I, I think that I'm very passionate about it. Um, you know, and I think, you know, without trying to get on a, you know, you don't want to get on a soapbox. Um, but I try to nicely project, you know, to the agents that we talk to, you know, don't be a one and dunner. Don't be that agent that's just going into the house and, and selling the one app and then never going back. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, realistically, you know, how, I mean, if you were, if we were all in a room and you said, okay, how many, how many people know someone who has cancer? I mean, the, the hands are going to fly up, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, right now we're in Breast Cancer Awareness Month. One in eight women are going to be diagnosed with cancer. So someone that we know is going to be diagnosed with cancer. Do you want to really be the insurance agent that didn't want to bring up cancer when you were in the, in that home? Right. And don't, and, and then that's my other thing is, well, you know, a lot of these people, they don't have money. Well, you, you don't necessarily know what they have or what they want to spend that money oh, on. Were you, how were you coming to that decision? Like, did you look? Yeah. Well, because I can tell you that I've been in homes where I thought the people didn't have money and they had money. Oh, yeah. Oh. They had money. Yep. It's just where they choose to put it. It is. And a lot of times it's, it's not the house. It's not the car. It's not the clothes. So right. It look as if they don't. Um, no, it's a very yeah. good point. Well, and and I thought, um, you know, Shep didn't have cancer insurance. Yeah. And, and then, you know, and then my mom and dad, my dad was self-employed. So at the point when my mother got sick, we didn't have health insurance. Hmm. So, um, you know, so that, and then it's, and then you try to explain to an agent or really even to someone who does have insurance, you right. say, it, it's really not about what the insurance is going to cover. It's going to be about what it doesn't cover. Right. And so I am very passionate about it. Oh, and it, it, it's hard when, you know, when, when you try to talk to folks and, you know, and they don't want to pay for it. I mean, I have probably, I'm insurance poor. <laughs> I've got so much insurance, you know. Yeah, a lot of insurance. So. Yeah, a lot of insurance. I'm not going to be the one, you know, because because I don't want my children right. to have to go through that. I don't want them to have to worry about it. Yeah, the story. Because I, that's who it falls on. That absolutely. The, the story I always share about my mom and going through her treatment, my very best friend, at the time my mom was diagnosed, her mother was also diagnosed. Well, my mom was past 65. She was 69 when she was diagnosed. So she was on Medicare, Plan F at the time, and had a cancer policy. 
And my friend's mom was still like 62 or something. So she was on a group health plan. So she chose the bare bones, you know, benefits to get her premium as low and had no cancer insurance. So it was it was sad kind of comparing those two stories because my mom, my mom and dad were farmers. They had, you know, no money. Every mm-hmm. one of those clients, um, it was all in the farm, right? Every dime they made, they put back into the farm. So, but every everything that came up with my mom's treatment from a doctor suggesting something to us asking about it, there was never a question of money, right? Between her meds up and her cancer plan, we could have taken her anywhere. We could have done any kind of treatment. We could have tried any kind of medication. Meanwhile, my friend is over here trying to juggle cancer treatment plus financial assistance and making decisions about her mom's care based on finance versus let's do whatever the heck we can do to get mom better. Let's try everything. Let's go here. Let's look at that. And so it's just, again, it has nothing to do with where your finances are when you go into a situation like that, but what is going to, what that cancer plan is going to come in and help pay for us. Because our, the hospital she was in was five and a half hours from me, two hours from my brother, three and a half hours from my dad, from home. So everybody's trying to, you know, juggle and, and that kind of stuff, that m- the money never came in to play. And that's what you want to have happen is when God forbid yeah. somebody's diagnosed, the last thing on earth you want to be thinking about is how are we going to pay for this? Or let's not go there because that would cost too much money in hotels and meals. Right. Yes. You know, you don't want somebody thinking about that when it comes to your care. Yeah. You know, um, we we lost um, Janet Frederick in our office. Yeah. yeah. Another last, oh last December. Yeah. Again, breast cancer. Yeah. Uh, so I think from the time that she was diagnosed, it was two years. Okay. So she was diagnosed with um, triple negative um, metastatic breast cancer. And, you know, she, she went, went really through it all, you know, all different types of treatments and everything, but, um, and she had great insurance, you know, her husband worked for Honda and they had great insurance and, um, that she had had a skin cancer before. So she, you know, cause we kept thinking we need to get a cancer. You need to get a cancer plan, cancer plan. And it was, it was too late. You know, because the the skin cancer, um, the look back period was was too short, and it wasn't until just recently that Scott told me that, um, you know, even as good as their insurance was, that there were times when you know he they were there for the treatment and they would say, well, you know, this treatment is going to be X amount of dollars. And so you've already hit the maximum. And so, you know, how are you going to pay for, how are you going to pay for today? And he said, you know, she didn't know that because she was over there getting her cold cap on and, you know, all of that. He said, and I didn't want to be the asshole saying, well, I haven't paid for it, you know? And he said, so, you know, it's like, look, I'm going to pay you $50 today and we're going to get the treatment and we'll work out the rest. Um, and it's hard. You just because people don't they don't realize no. what can happen. So in all that you've gone through, Shannon, where where do you go? Like what's your source of inspiration? Because you have to be on, right? Most of the time. Your mom, yeah. grandma, your boss, your managing partner, you know, all the things that you juggle that people need you to be the helper of them and pouring more, you know positivity into that whatever where do you go like what's your solitude place or where do you go to fill that cup for you so that you can continue being Shanna well I'm a I'm a stuffer I stuff I stuff things down yep um but I just you know obviously my face um you have to you have to believe you know I know that one day I'm going to see my mom. I'm going to see Daryl. I'm going to see my dad. I'm going to see my brother. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll be together again. Um, but right now it's just a matter of, you know, I, I mean, I have to lead my family. I mean, I still have two, they're adults, but I mean, you know, one's in college and one's fixing to graduate from, from cosmetology school. And, um, you know, and then my daughter, she's 30, but she still needs me. She still needs her mom, you know? Um, 
And so, you know, you, I just think I don't ever look at it as, you know, moving past or moving forward, but, um, you know, you have to keep going. And so you don't forget anything that that's happened. I think everything that's happened has made me who I am today. And sometimes I even, I've, 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 I think I've told you this before, um, you know, when we have our sisterhood meetings or whatever, you know, sometimes I feel a little bit callous, you know, when, when people complain about certain things, you know, um, you know, I've had a lot of loss and, um, you know, Daryl was in the war. He was, you know, he was over in the war for seven months. And then we had a, had Kennedy. She was, you know, she was born over in Germany. We were in, then we were in the hospital for a month with doctors who didn't speak English. We had to be medevaced back to the States. She and I lived in the hospital for six months. Then when we got out, you know, the army couldn't decide what they were going to do with him. And so we lived in, in a room in someone's house that, you know, offered it to us from a church there in San Antonio. And you, and we're given a car, you know, a little, because my car was still over in Germany. And, you know, I look at all of these things and they really kind of make you who you are. So when people complain about trivial things, it really just kind of, I'm just like, really, you know, is that all you got? Right. right. So, like a story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, let's sit down and have a little conversation. Yeah. Um, but I just, you know, I just think that you have to, you can either be the person who says, okay, well, this is everything that's happened to me and this is why I can't do this. Or you're going to be the person that says, you know what? Yeah, that's happened, but I'm capable of doing more. And so let's just keep going. And, and I think that's just, that's just who I am. And I, and I think I got that from my mom. Yeah. Yeah. No, I would have loved to have met her. She sounds super, uh, but I think you're absolutely right. I think the, all the things that happen to us in our life is our life, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that that happened to me or why did that happen to me or why me? That's a pet. I, I heard a, a phrase yesterday. I'll see if I can get this right. And I'll try to clean it up a little bit, but it was basically, it was somebody that was talking about all these bad things that have happened. And if you don't use those things for right. good or mm -hmm. to teach or to model it, but, but her phrase was, you can turn poo into um, fertilizer. So in other mm -hmm. words, there you go. Yeah. There's a lot of poo that's happening, you know, in, in life and in certain days you feel like it's piling on. But if you're not utilizing that to make things better, which is what fertilizer does then it was just all for naught. So I would think that right. the people that you've lost, the people that um, are still looking and watching and are so proud of you. So the way you carry yourself, the way you walk into a room, the way you carry on a conversation, you're always caring about somebody else. I just think that that, that has to be because of all of those things that all the mentors, all the, the, the losses, all the gains, all the wins. I mean, look around. I mean, you've had some amazing life stories too. Um, and I think all of that is just, that's Shanna, right? It's not <laughs> this, this happened or why did that, or why did I go that path? And this person went that path. Um, I just think that there's, there's so many people that look up to you and, and respect you and, whether they know your path or not, it doesn't matter, but it's because it all formed, you know, the you that you are today. So it's, it's a huge, that's a huge compliment to you because there are things that make us maybe take a step back or a step, like wondering, is this, am I in the right spot? Am I doing the right thing? Am I in the right path? Um, but you just keep, keep on keeping on. <laughs> that's that's all we can do, right? That's a good that's testament. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and just the last couple of minutes that we have, we've talked about Shanna, the mom and, and grandma, but walk everybody through a little bit where your kids are at now uh, and how those grandbabies are doing. Oh my gosh. So um, Tanner is kind of in hiatus. He's working and um, he's decided that he wants to go to electrician school. So okay. he just turned 20. Yep. Good. Very nice. So he came home uh, last semester and said, why am I having to sit through a class and learn about all this history when this is not what I'm going to do? And I said, hey, well, okay, let's 
figure it out. Because <laughs> my son. Um, yeah. yeah. And then Avery is graduating from um, from her uh, esthetician school on November 9th. So oh, she will be um, a licensed esthetician. So she's very excited about that. She's been in Texas or is she there? Then she's here. Yeah, she's, she's here. Yeah. And then um, Kennedy is married and with two children so halen just turned three and miles was born in february Miles, and um they live in frisco in texas so obviously she's just like you know when are you coming back here kind of a thing oh i could yeah, probably so we'll think that too yeah I, I i do think that i do i do think that and then um and then if you know anything about me you know i have when i bought this house two years ago that i'm in um you know, it came with a chicken and a chicken coop. Oh, how and, then, and so my my girlfriend, who's my real estate agent, thought it would be great to get me some chicks when I moved into the house. And then it became a whole thing. So now I'm a chicken mama. You are. And, um, yeah, so I go out every day and let the girls out and get their eggs and <laughs> talk to them. Talk to I would probably tell them. I do. I talk to them. And I've got one that gets up on the fence every night and doesn't go back into the coop. So I have to go out every evening and get her off the fence and take her inside and talk to her. Wild one, always trying to escape. There's yeah. always one, right? Yeah. And then I've got Sam, who's my golden doodle. And, um, you know, when we were in our office, he was, he's the office, you know, dog. He loves everybody. And so loves to go on car rides. And yeah, so, so that my animals keep me. Keep me busy. What a fun life you have, right? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it fun to think about sometimes, like where we're at and the, not even the, the business side or anything like that, but just being able to sit here as, as two professional women who have put our family first all these years and have been able to raise a business as well as raise a family and yeah. have our two I mean, hogs and yeah i mean i look back and you know we all make mistakes right so i've it's it's not been perfect i've made my mistakes along the way but again we get past them and and work through them and try to come out on the other side better and um yeah so you know one one thing that i did i did notice kennedy sent me um a picture um and it was a side-by-side -side picture of avery when she was a baby and then of Miles. And if you have seen Avery, Avery is a mini me of Daryl. Of Daryl. And yeah. so, yeah. And so oh. now to see um, Miles next to a baby pitcher, I'm like, oh, these babies oh, look like Daryl. <laughs> we're going to have a little Daryl running around. <laughs> Let's see. So that's what I'm thinking. That's awesome. Well, what a sweet story to end on. And I can't thank you enough. Shanna for agreeing one to come on here I know it's a busy time for everybody but thank you, know, you. well enjoy hearing your story and and digging a little deeper into into the the Shanna archives and how fun it's been to to watch you and be side by side in many cases um with all the different events and activities we've got going on but yeah, cheer have fun. To, cheers to many many more there's <laughs> thank you my dear thank you everybody Right. Thanks, Dana. All right, I'll see ya.